وكذلك أوحينا إليك روحا من أمرنا ما كنت تدري ما الكتاب ولا الإيمان ولكن جعلناه نورا ولكن جعلناه نورا نهدي به من نشاء من عبادنا وإنك لتهدي إلى صراط مستقيم صراط الله الذي له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض ألا إلى الله تصير الأمور السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to a new episode of Inspirations We say first of all, all praise is due to Allah We praise Him, we seek His help and we ask for His guidance And we send peace and blessings upon our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Welcome to the live ep- episode of Inspirations. Today, inshallah, we will be waiting for your phone calls to have you share, and we want to hear from you about the topics that we are, discuss- are, that are discussing today of the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Last week, we closed when we were talking about the promise that Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of the uh, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, the promise he made to slaughter one of his sons, if Allah gives him at least ten children, and Allah did give him ten children. So Abdul Muttalib found himself in a dilemma. He had to slaughter one of his children. Now before we see how Abdul Muttalib got himself out of this, I would like to just give some kind of introduction about certain things which are important to the methodology we are following in this uh, program in this show. We said previously, right at the beginning of this series on the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu uh, alaihi wasallam, we pointed out the importance of only accepting the authentic narrations. I was recently, I came across certain comments about, from some people, some people are very dear to me. I heard from them certain comments that really uh, show some kind of disrespect to some of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu uh, or some disregard towards them. I was shocked to see that, but when I investigated, I found out the reason behind this was depending on uh, wrong or unreliable sources and narrations, historical uh, narrations. And actually these narrations mutilate and they mar the beauty of our history. This is why it's our obligation before we take a stance, before we accept a judgment about anything in the, in the life of the Prophet ﷺ, in the life of his companions, or in our Islamic history in general. We can't accept anything before we verify the authenticity of the narration. Otherwise, we, will be, we would be falling into lying, into deception, and into mistake and error. So as Muslims, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, that if someone unreliable, if someone whose reliability is, or his honesty, or, or his integrity is doubted, if he comes to you with the news, then verify it. Lest you might harm other people without knowing that. And in our history, there were so many attempts Right from the early times of our history, from the beginning of our history, right after the death of the Prophet wasallam, so many people tried to change our history. Because the ones who write history are the ones who control the destiny of nations. So, at the early stages of our nation, the Islamic nation, there were so many attempts to distort the image of the early generation, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. And if you read the books of history, you will find so many narrations speaking very bad about them, mentioning things that you want, you can't really accept, you can't really believe that such a wonderful generation fell into such errors. Some narrations actually describe some of the companions with deception, with uh, having a conniving character and ulterior motives, lying and all that stuff. But when we come to verify these narrations, we would find them wrong and all fabricated. They came through liars. You find in the chains of narration of these narrations, you will find liars who fabricated, who made up lies in order 
to mutilate the Islamic history in order to mar the beauty of the early generation. We know it's the best example, the companions of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So it's our responsibility as Muslims. If we want to have a clear image of our history, which, is, which means a clear, a clear image of our identity, a clear understanding of who we are and who our ancestors were, and how great that generation was, we have to follow the authentic narrations. Now there is a methodology that is accepted, unanimously accepted among the scholars of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. This methodology says, it was actually stated by Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. He says when it comes to the Sharia, to the legislation, when it comes to the Aqeedah of Islam, we are very stringent, we are very strict when we criticize the narrations. We don't accept any narration. It has to pass and meet certain conditions, otherwise it will be rejected. But when it comes to the seerah and history and historic accounts, we won't accept them. Or actually we will try, we will, we'll try to be lenient with, with regards to these. Why? Because the early scholars paid or concentrated their attention on preserving the sharia, preserving the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And they did a wonderful and a marvelous job. Our religion has been protected by the will of Allah and the efforts of our early scholars who established a system of checking and verifying narrations that has no parallel in all sciences and in all the you know, uh, annals of history. This is something special that we have, that our early scholars established this wonderful science of which we call Mustalah al-Hadith, the science of Hadith. So when it comes to the Sharia, to Aqeedah, and when it comes to Fiqh, they are very strict when they check the narrations. But when it comes to history, they sometimes try to be lenient because the early generations, they didn't pay great attention to the historic accounts for one reason, because they concentrated on the Fiqh and Aqeedah. And even when history, history doesn't make that big change when it comes to uh, trivial and insignificant events but the main events in the life of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam the main events in the life of the companions of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam were preserved and we have them in our early sources on history on our history so let's make it our methodology we won't accept anything that is said about the prophet peace be upon him or about the companions of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam we won't accept anything until we have verified the authenticity of these narrations. With this, we would save ourselves from falling into error, from disrespecting some of the great companions, and disrespecting our early generations who held Islam, who actually Islam was handed down to us through them. And we should follow this methodology even today. When we hear certain events, when we hear so many people claiming to do certain things, and claiming to defend Islam, claiming to be concerned about the Muslims and about Palestine and about Iraq and about the oppressed Muslims, we shouldn't take their claims for granted. We should see all of this in context. The context of history and the context of their aqidah and their faith. There are so many people today there's a group among the Muslims, it's a huge group among the Muslims today. They, clear, they claim to be defending Islam, they claim to be upholding Islam, they claim that they will bring victory and honor to Islam and the Muslims. But if we consider the history of this group, we would find a bloody history. These people who claim to be defending Islam, in history, they persecuted Muslims. They wronged the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. They always supported the enemies of Islam, like for the Mughals or the Tatars. When they invaded Baghdad, they invaded, invaded Baghdad through the help or by the help or with the help of, the, of this group. And when they entered Damascus, the Mughals, it was the help of this group of Muslims who helped them. And even Salah al-Din, may Allah have mercy on him, the one who freed Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, from the grip of the crusaders. He, he was, there were so many attempts to assassinate him by these people, by this group of people. So this is why Salahuddin, before fighting the crusaders, he fought these people and he annihilated them. So we have to see these people in the light of their history. Throughout the history, they are persecuted Muslims, especially in Asia. 
They persecuted, persecuted the people of Ahlul Sunnah. And then they come today with a new shape, claiming to be the holders of the honor of Islam. We say to them, we don't believe you because they, you have a bloody history. And if we consider their aqidah, their faith, their belief, we would see shocking facts about their belief. We would see them claiming that the Qur'an is not authentic. We would hear them and read in their books, cursing the companions of the Prophet wasallam, considering them to be kuffar, to be apostates. How is it that someone is going to bring honor to Islam while he is cursing the companions of the Prophet wasallam? This means the Prophet didn't manage or was a failure in teaching and educating, uh, and educating his companions. This is something unacceptable. We have to see everything in context. Put it in context and you will see everything clear. So, uh, these, I thought of actually talking about these points before we start. Because, inshallah, every time as we go, uh, as we go on in the seerah, we'll try to shed some light on our situation today, the situation of the Muslims, so we benefit from what we are doing now. Because Sira is not only entertainment, it's not a matter of storytelling. Yes, there is storytelling element in it, but the main thing of it is achieving the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا Indeed, for you in the Prophet wasallam, there is the role model. For those who are looking forward, those who are looking up to the time when they will meet Allah on the Day of Judgment. Now before we carry on and we get back to what happened with Abdul Muttalib when he was about to slaughter one of his children, let me take this phone call. We have Sister Wafat from Egypt. Assalamu alaikum, Sister. Wa alaikum, Assalamu alaikum, wa rahmatullahi wa How are you? Alhamdulillah, uh, I have to apologize for interrupting you, Sheikh. Uh, no, thank you very much. Go on, Sister. Um, uh, please, I have some comments about uh, the previous episode. Yes, go ahead. Uh, your explanation uh, for the, the meaning of uh, Jahiliya was yeah. so perfect and it was very first time to know that uh, Jahiliya doesn't uh, mean uh, uh, the period uh, period of time before Islam uh, and it many many other it, ha- it has many other meanings yes uh, one of them is uh, the wrong practice you said that all the wrong practice uh, can be considered as an act of Jahiliya yes so according to this explanation, we can see that mo- many Muslims nowadays live in Jahiliya. Uh, uh, even if they are keep on praying, fasting, reciting Quran, but they still indulge in many prohibitions, many wrong practices. Yes. But unfortunately, some of these wrong practices are approved or are supported by some of those who work in Dawa field. Yeah. Uh, for instance, uh, when you find someone says that uh, dealing with interest is not haram or uh, listening to the music is not haram uh, yes. and so on. Yes. Uh, when you try to uh, to give advice to deliver the true knowledge, you will be rejected. Okay. Mm. Uh, uh, you talked about the Orientalists and their go and their goals, but you didn't talk about the the, the Muslims who work in Dawa field and have the same attitude. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think those who can gather the people around them and uh, through their fatwas, through their opinions, they keep on uh, the state of Jahiliya uh, being continued among the Muslims. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, yes. Um, I, I, I don't have more to say, but um, I, I have your. Uh, I want to hear your explanation. Inshallah. Thank Inshallah, Sister Wafat, thank you very much. Actually, these are very good points. First of all, with Jahiliya, it's a more comprehensive. A concept that as we said it includes more than it's not it doesn't actually refer to a period of time but refers to an attitude to an understanding of life and to mainly to polytheism shirk associating partners with Allah uh, and other practices uh, that are related to it or that emanate from it as you said Jazakumullah khairan alhamdulillah but to apply the concept of jahiliya to Muslims we have to be very careful yes the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa uh, applied this concept to one of the companions when he said to Bilal, as the narration states, uh, he said to him, you are the son of, uh, of the black woman. He said, in you, in you are a person in, who, uh, or in whom there is jahiliya. So actually, the Prophet ﷺ was referring to one aspect of his character. He didn't say, you are in jahiliya, but there are some aspects in which you have this jahiliya. And if we are to apply this concept today, to the Muslims, we can't say so many Muslims are living in a state of jahiliya, but we say, okay, 
there are some aspects in which they have jahiliyyah, which is true. But to say that the Muslims live today, or uh, a great deal of the Muslims today live in jahiliyyah, well, that might be some kind of overgeneralization. We have to be precise. If we want to tackle a problem or an illness, and, uh, or a dilemma and we try to deal with it, we have to be very precise because we have to develop uh, a very precise vision, a very precise and accurate understanding and from there we go on to inshallah healing it and uh, providing the remedy. We can't say these, these people live in a state of jahiliyyah but there are some aspects in their lives, yes, they have jahiliyyah like those people who deal with interest, it's not interest basically, it is harm. As the prophet, as the prophet, or as all the all the texts in Islam suggest and make clear that this is harm and this is a disaster, and you will be bringing the anger of Allah on you if you deal with the riba, if you either take it or give it, you are taking, or even if you are signing these contracts, you are part of it. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa taala to protect us from this. So we, because some people actually apply this, and these are the people who went deep into takfir. They claim that the Muslim societies today live in a state of jahiliyyah. No, we can't say that. That's exaggeration. And that's not the way of the Prophet ﷺ. We have to look and we have to see the Muslims with an eye of mercy and an eye of concern. These are all brothers and sisters. Yes, they have some aspects where they went wrong. We have to rectify them. It's our responsibility. It's our obligation. And we, are, we believe that we... We are getting nearer to Allah by trying to fix these aspects. So we have to see the situation with an eye of mercy. And regarding the, some of the people who are in the field of da'wah and they have these misconceptions, this is a very strong point. May Allah reward you, sister. It is a ver- it's very important. And thank you for really bringing it to our attention. I will, inshallah, try to deal with it and shed some light on it because it is very important. And some of these people are very influential and they are spreading a wrong understanding about Islam because they have been so much influenced by the strength of the Western discourse and the discourse of some of the enemies of Islam. Now, let's have a short break. We'll carry on after it, so stay tuned. It's just Allah's way to make they are dumb, though they can express themselves in a very beautiful way, in a very eloquent way, but when it comes to the truth, they become dumb. The forces of Rahman, Wa'ibad Rahman, those people who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what they are supposed to do, spend their money to support this deen. Wayurti sadaqat and he increases sadaqah. That amount which you give in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is increased by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And people need each other's, need scholars more than they need to drink and eat. Because even regarding what we drink and eat, we may not be able to figure out which is permissible and which is not. The Quran is not preserved in the books only. The seerah of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam is not preserved in the books only, but in the, heart, in the hearts of men in the hearts of people who have devoted their time to seeking knowledge. Believe and trust tawakkal that none could take place without the knowledge of Allah. into the early tafsir, early exegesis of the Quran, you will find that uh, all the Mufassirin were trying to find out where are the seven earths. Earthquakes, natural or artificial, can delineate the boundaries between seven different zones within the earth. 
uh, the conclusion that we have seven different layers within the earth came to not only in the 20th century the true believer would prostrate down in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the blessings of that prostration will reach the seventh earth It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back. You're still watching Inspirations Live. We will be waiting for your phone calls. So please do call us. The numbers will appear on the screen. And let me remind you as well of our email address. You can write to us on inspirations at huda.tv. Before I get into how Abdul Muttalib got himself out of the dilemma. Uh, I would like just to point out that I really thank uh, Sister Anne for her uh, emails, mashallah, very good suggestions, very good points, and I took some of them into consideration. Like really, uh, she had one suggestion which was very good, mashallah, and it met something that I thought of previously, which was uh, really going deep into the misconceptions presented and stated by the Orientalists. I found out that it won't add so much to the seerah of the Prophet So I thought of an alternative, which is to mention some of their misconceptions, the main ones. Mention them, mentioning, I thought of mentioning them just quickly, pointing out their uh, faults and where they went wrong and how to review them very quickly in the light of the events that we will be mentioning inshallah, without needing to go into their books or their names. Sometimes. I will have to state some of their names, but we will deal quickly with their misconceptions because really their books are not very widespread, even among the average Western reader. But the thing is, even though Western readers, the average Western reader won't read their books, or mainly they don't read their books, or they don't have access, or they don't have an interest into such a subject. But the thing is, when someone writes a novel, or a story, or a movie, or a piece of news, they all depend on these, on the books of Orientalists. So, so they come and they emanate, they stem from these books. This is why it's very important to just develop a general awareness of where the Orientalists come from and another objective behind dealing with the books of the Orientalists and their lies is just to expose the reality of their so-called scholarship. And you will see inshallah today, or inshallah next week as well, some of the lies, the outright lies, because they actually they take advantage of the fact that most of the Western readers they don't read Arabic, so they don't have access to the Arabic original books on the Sirah of the Prophet So they use they use that they take advantage of it in order to create a first impression which we call the reference point, and then it's very hard to move the Western reader or the the Western uh, viewers from that reference point. It would take a lot of effort by the Muslims to create a new reference point which is based on the truth. Okay, and I thank as well, there's another brother, brother from Nigeria who sent us a wonderful email that he went into some of the books that talk about Orientalism uh, and about some of the writings of Western scholars among, because among the Western scholars there are ones who are unbiased, who are just and they are looking for the truth and they have some good contributions to Islam and the Muslims and to uh, clarifying the truth to the general public and hopefully that by their good intent intention we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide them to the truth. Now let's get back to Abdul Muttalib. Abdul Muttalib was in trouble. He's got 10 children now and he is to slaughter one of them and he was determined to fulfill this promise. Now the only authentic narration on this event says that Abdul Muttalib he himself thought of ransoming Abdullah because when they drew the lots, the lots fell on Abdullah. So he had no choice but to slaughter his child Abdullah. The authentic narration states that he said, Oh Allah, I would I will ransom my son with a hundred camels. Now a hundred camels is a huge amount of wealth. Imagine, even if we talk about, in, in terms of today's money, today's currency, a, a camel would, in average, cost maybe about $5,000. When you are talking about, far, uh, talking about 100 camels, it means about half a million. Now, that's a great wealth. 
only for ransoming his child. And it tells us here now that when you want something from Allah, you don't have to make a vow. Allah is generous. He would give you. All what you have to do is ask Him. Ask Him, call on Him and have trust in Allah and Allah inshallah will grant you what is good for you. You don't have to make a promise or make a vow to harm yourself or harm your children or harm somebody else. No. So this is why the Prophet ﷺ actually advised the believers not to make a vow. But once you have made a vow, then you have to stick to it. Some other narrations, they have not been authenticated. But there's no harm in mentioning these. Now this is part of the leniency of the scholars of hadith when it comes to history. History, historical events that have no relation to the fiqh or aqidah, there's no harm. Inshallah, you will see as we go through this era that sometimes we will bring some of the narrations that have not, that have not been verified. But these narrations... They are not related to fiqh or aqidah to, or to a major event in the life or an event that would change the course of event, events or anything else. It wouldn't have that weight in the history. So there's no harm if we bring such narrations whose weakness is tolerable in order to make a complete image, in order to fill some of the gaps that we would find in some of the incidents. And as I said, the condition is, they should not be related to aqidah or fiqh. Some of these narrations say, for example, that Abdul Muttalib was in trouble, and he was about to slaughter Abdullah. But the leaders of Quraysh came to him and they said, are you crazy? You're going to slaughter your son? And you know your position among the people of Quraysh. You know if you do it, people will follow you. So it would become a habit or it would become a tradition that if someone gets ten children or ten sons, he would slaughter one of them. Are you going to establish a, a nasty practice like this among us? So he said, okay, help me get out of, it, out of this. They said, okay, there is a, a fortune teller or there is a witch. Okay, with Bani Sa'ad, we can go to her and she would get you out of that. They went to this witch and she said, okay, after hearing the whole story, she said, what you have to do, you have to bring ten camels, which was considered to be the average or the standard blood money at that time. Bring ten camel, camels, put them on one side, and bring Abdullah on the other side. And then drew the, draw the lots. If they fall on Abdullah, then you have to add another ten camels. They become twenty. But if the... and so on and so forth. Every time the lots fall on Abdullah, then you have to add ten camels. But if the lots fall on the camels, then that's it. That's his ransom. So, they actually did that. As the narration suggests. They did that. They cast the lots first time. It came on Abdullah. Another time, they drew the lots. came on Abdullah. For ten times, the lots fell on Abdullah. After that, after they reached a hundred camels, the lots fell on the camels. They did it again and again and again in order to make sure and the lots fell on the camels. So for them that was a sign that Abdullah is freed. Now, you could imagine how happy Abdul Muttalib was. And how happy the whole family was. Imagine, Abdullah was the youngest among his children. And was the dearest to him. <clears throat> and he was going to slaughter him. Now, getting out of this calamity, he didn't mind paying all that wealth. A hundred camels, which is worth about half a million, or even maybe a million at our times in order to save his child. Now Abdullah was very happy. Abdullah grew up and he became a young man. It seems from the uh, impression that we get from the books of history that Abdullah had a mild character, a beautiful character. He wasn't a troublemaker. He wasn't someone who made a big difference in, this, in his surroundings. He had a very mild character because there is very little news, no, no, very little news and events known about him. So it indicates that he was an average person, a very soft kind of character. This is how he carried himself throughout his young age. Then Abdullah reached the age of marriage. And as any young man, he was looking for a wife. Abdul Muttalib paid great attention to find a good wife for his son Abdullah. Because he loved him so much. Looking and looking in the houses of Mecca, trying to find a wife for Abdullah. Abdul Muttalib chose Amina. Now Amina was among the most respected and respectable uh, families in Mecca and in Quraysh. 
Abdullah was very happy. He found Amina to be a wonderful wife. They both had dreams as a family. A husband and a wife. Newly married. They had so many dreams about children, about building a wonderful house, a beautiful house, as it seems to be, the, this is the impression that we get from the books of history. And everyone was happy that Abdullah was not slaughtered by his father. And how much, you could imagine how much Abdullah, how happy he was, and how Amina was happy with him. But even though Abdullah was saved from death with the ransom of a hundred camels, he was heading to his own death on the back of, one of, of, of another camel. One day Abdul Muttalib sent Abdullah to Yathrib. Yathrib was the name of Medina, which we know today as Medina, about 400 kilometers to the north of Mecca, in order to bring dates. Because we know Mecca is a barren valley, it's a barren area. There is no agriculture, there's no vegetation, very little grass and herbs here and there. But Medina is very known for the palm trees, for the date palms. So Abdullah went to Medina in order to bring dates. Now the news came with the travelers to Mecca, to Abdul Muttalib, your son is very ill. Another shocking news later on came to Abdul Muttalib that Abdullah was dying. Now, that was a great shock to Abdul Muttalib. His dearest son is dying 400 kilometers away from him. And who's, most, who's actually in a worse situation was Amina. His wife, she was waiting for her husband. Thinking of all the good days, thinking of all the future that is ahead of them, thinking of all their plans, having children, and maybe you know, building a new house, and having a wonderful life. All these dreams were vanishing now, because of the news that came to them, that Abdullah was dying. Abdul Muttalib was shocked. He was agitated by that, and he was waiting for the news. Every traveler coming from Medina, Abdullah would go and see him. Abdullah was, uh, Abdul Muttalib was, go, went to see him. He was standing on the way, on the borders of Mecca, waiting for any traveler coming from Medina. And he was hoping to hear someone saying to him, Abdullah was recovering, Abdullah was recovering, or Abdullah was coming. But the news came to Abdul Muttalib that Abdullah had died. That was a great shock to Abdul Muttalib. And it was a greater shock to Amina. Now all the dreams of Amina and Abdullah vanished. All of them disappeared. It was a new situation for Amina. And in her womb, there was the child of Abdullah. That was the greatest man to be born. That was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the father of Muhammad died when Muhammad was in the womb of his mother. So he came to this life as an orphan. Everyone in that family was shocked. They were touched, deeply touched, by that sad incident, the death of Abdullah. So the hundred camels did not avail him. Yes, he was saved from being slaughtered. He was saved from death. But his destiny was to die soon after. And this was exactly what happened. Abdullah died, and the, all the dreams, all the sweet days that Amina thought of, vanished and disappeared forever. Now, in all this silence and all this sadness, something came to Sheikh Mecca. There was a great army of 20,000 soldiers, fully equipped heading towards Mecca in order to destroy the sacred house, to destroy the house of Allah. What is the story? The silence was broken. All the sadness about Abdullah disappeared because there was a great event happening. Mecca was all at stake. It was all to be demolished and destroyed, especially the sacred house. When they heard the news, what happened? What brought this army? How did they come here? What is their goal? What is their objective? What are the reasons behind this army heading towards Mecca? Now this is something we have to look into. We have to go back in history to see what happened. This, history, this army was coming from Yemen, from the south, was heading towards Mecca. Let's see check, and check the history of Yemen. Yemen was under the reign 
of the Arab tribes like Himyar and Saba. And we know the dam of Ma'rib, which actually was the basis of civilization in Yemen. Now, Yemen went through different stages in history, and it, there were so many Christians in Yemen, especially in Najran, the area called Najran. One, actually, at some stage of the history of Yemen, the leader of Yemen or the governor of Yemen embraced Judaism. And then he persecuted the Christians. He dug a ditch for them and he set fire in that ditch and he persecuted the Christians. And we know this is the story referred to in the Quran in Surah Al Buruj, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this story. So the Roman Empire, because they were Christians, the Abyssinians were Christians, they decided to retaliate. So they sent an army in order to take revenge of these, the people of Yemen, the Jews in Yemen. Now what happened, inshallah, we'll find out. Just let me take this phone calls. We have Brother Muhammad from Mauritania. Assalamu salam alaykum, Brother. Alaykum salam, Shaykh. Kif halak? Alhamdulillah. How are you? Alaykum salam. Go ahead, please. Alhamdulillah. I very love you. Sorry, Akhi, go ahead. I love you very much. Jazakumullah khair. May Allah love you and grant us His mercy and guidance. Jazakumullah khair, Akhi. Yeah, thanks. I, I, I ask you what about this uh, Abdullah? What is his cause? His was sick or uh, just uh, dead cancer? Sorry, uh, Muhammad, can you say this again, please? I ask it what's cause to Abdullah? To this Ab okay, seems that. Okay, since that is, was cut off. Inshallah, okay. What happened actually, please, Brother Muhammad, if you can call us again. We will be waiting for your, for your phone call. The thing that what happened, Yemen, as I said, was taken over later on by the Christians. And uh, uh, the, the, the army of this Ab the Abyssinian, uh, or the leader of the Abyssinian army which took over Yemen was called Aryat. Aryat became the governor of Al Yemen, and then later on, certain events happened that led to that great army moving towards Mecca. What was these event? What were, what were these events? We will find out, inshallah, after having the short break. So stay tuned. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. The companions of the Prophet all of them trustworthy. We don't look into their. Uh, 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 or their adala, uh, uh, of they are trustworthy or not. They are all trustworthy. <laughs> Following their footsteps will bring others, will, will bring us together. It will be part of that robe which binds us as an, a one ummah. If you look into the early tafsir, early exegesis of the Quran, you will find that uh, all the mufassirin were trying to find out where are the seven earths. Earthquakes, natural or artificial, can delineate the boundaries between seven different zones within the earth. The, the conclusion that we have seven different layers within the earth came to not only the 20th century, the true believer would prostrate down in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the blessings of that prostration will reach the seventh earth. The deeds are bound by its intentions. The deeds that we do, we have to have a sincere intentions that we're doing it only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have the best definitions of things, the right vision, the criteria in which we would get to know what is right and what is wrong through the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu The tafsir of the Quran is to explain, is to interpret 
the best words, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is just Allah's way to make us feel. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back. You're still watching Inspirations Live. And inshallah, we will be waiting for your phone call. Before we carry on, let me take this phone call. We have Sister Asya on the phone from Saudi Arabia. Salam alaikum, Sister. Salam alaikum, Sister. Salam alaikum, Sister. Walaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yes. Hello, this is Malam from Nigeria. Thank you so much. Can, can you speak up, please, sister? Salam alaikum. Walaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yes, go ahead. I thank you, Omar, for your message. It means all the video stuff. I have a small address to all the Muslims. I mean, I mean, thank you so much. May Allah reward you. Okay, is that all? Okay, thank you very much, Sister uh, Asya from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Okay, let's carry on and see what happened with Yemen. Now, Yemen, after Ariyat became the governor of Yemen, uh, they actually spread Christianity there. And what happened, Ariyat was assassinated by the leader of, or by the commander of his army, and that was called Abraha. Abraha is known as Al-Ashram. Now, when Abraha assassinated Ariyat, and Al-Najashi, the leader of Abyssinia, was very upset with Abraha. What Abraha did, he sent some gifts and presents to uh, Al-Najashi. Then he went there, and in his conniving way, he earned the pleasure and the acceptance of Al-Najashi. And, and he appointed him again to be the governor of Al-Yaman. Now, what did Ariyad do? Insha'Allah, we will see after we have Sister Asya again with us. Salaam alaykum, Sister. Salaam alaykum, Sheikh Matasim. This what? is Asya. And uh, Masha'Allah, we all, I and my family, enjoy your inspiration program. Masha'Allah, uh, Zakum Lakhir. Yes, uh, you have a very good way of presenting the, uh, the whatever the matter you say. Though we read in the books, but when we hear it from the from from you, we feel more difference. Alhamdulillah. Uh, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And every Friday we listen to Rekaha from your sweet, uh, beautiful voice. And we, Thank you very much. I and my family enjoy this. Jazakallah khair. May Allah, May Allah reward you. Bless you. May Allah reward you. May Allah reward you and bless you and your family, sister. Thank you very much. I really appreciate this. And I hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants us sincerity in all of this. Because without sincerity, it would be nothing. And the thing is, we, we, we are trying our best to benefit ourselves and to benefit our brothers and sisters all around the world and even to benefit those who want to know more about Islam. With only, inshallah, one goal, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to really help us achieve sincerity, which is to make all, all our efforts for the sake of propagating Islam and just making the clear and the real image of Islam, making it clear and open to everyone to embrace it and benefit from it. So oh, let's see what Abraha did. Abraha, after noticing that all the Arabs were going to Mecca to make pilgrimage at one time every year, he inquired about that. And they told him that this house was built by their grandfather, who they claimed to be a prophet, Ibrahim, and they all make pilgrimage there. He said, okay, I will make them Okay, I will cause them to make pilgrimage to Yemen. And that he, he established or he built a church, a huge and massive church, which he called al Qulays, And it was a wonderful construction, actually. Some parts of it, like the domes, were made out of gold. Uh, then he summoned and he called, he spread the word among the Arabian Peninsula to come and worship and make pilgrimage to this Qulays, to this house. What happened? None of the Arabs came to him. And actually some reports suggest that some of the Arabs went there and they disrespected, they dishonored the place by defecating in that place. So Abraha became very angry and very agitated and then he was determined to go to Mecca and destroy this house. They, he said, if they don't want to come to my house here and worship, I'm going to destroy their house and then they will have to come here and worship. They, they will have no other alternative. So he set up this army made of 20,000 soldiers 
and he made something extraordinary and never known to the Arabs. He brought, he brought uh, elephants to lead the army. Because, because we know elephants are very massive, very gigantic animals and they can demolish the Kaaba. And they would be scary. And that would be actually, this is part of the psychological war as well. When the Arabs see the, the elephants, he knew that these Arabs, they won't fight against him. They won't resist that army. Some actually, there is no authentic narration that states that, the lead, that uh, Abraha himself led the army towards Mecca. But that he sent another, some of the narrations suggest that he sent another a leader which, who was called Sim, Sambar or Simbar. But regardless, anyway, there is no reliable narration about this. Maybe Abraham, maybe somebody else. But it was someone who was sent to Mecca to lead this army. We have a phone call from Nigeria. Salaamu Alaikum, brother. Salaamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Salaam wa Salaam wa Barakatuh. I just call to greet you and to say to pray for you, may the Almighty Allah bless you and your family and all your group that are doing this, our program. Mm -hmm. I really love you. I love Muhammad Salah and all the producers of the program. MashaAllah. May Allah reward you, Akhi. I really thank you. And I, also... um, yes. and I just want to ask one question, but maybe it's out of the program, but it's about picture photograph. Is it haram or halal? Okay, brother, I would suggest, just because I don't want to get this program out of its objective, if you really uh, call and ask Huda, and Sheikh Muhammad Salah, I'm sure he would give you uh, a comprehensive answer. That would be enough, inshallah. And uh, even if you don't call them, I, would, I will forward the question to Brother Jameel, inshallah, for Sheikh Muhammad Salah to answer this question fully and give you full guidance about the subject. Okay, brother, may Allah reward you for this phone call and for your nice words and for your encouragement. And I really appreciate all of this. And I say that this program, alhamdulillah, uh, a great part of it has been your own encouragement and your own suggestions and your own advice. So may Allah reward you. And as I said, it's a collective effort. Don't look at or don't only consider what you see on the screen. There are so many brothers working behind the, the scenes. And they deserve, inshallah, a lot of reward from Allah and a lot of appreciation from all of us. Okay, so the army of Abraha al-Ashram headed towards Mecca. He was opposed by one of the tribes first and he totally destroyed them and he took their leader as captive. Then he headed on towards Mecca again and there was another tribe that tried to resist him but he destroyed them totally. Now the army of Abraha headed towards Mecca or he, they approached Mecca from the east because that was the best way to get straight into the house, into the Kaaba, in order to destroy it. Now the authentic narrations state that all the people of Mecca were advised to go on the mountains, to leave Mecca, evacuate Mecca totally, because they won't be able to resist such an army. They knew that, and they realized that they had no chance stopping this army. So they decided just to save themselves, and save their wealth, and their children, and their families, and watch what was going to happen from the top of the mountain. Now the only one who did something different was Abdul Muttalib. According to the authentic narration on this, Abdul Muttalib went to the leader of, or the commander of that army and he said to him, what brought you here? With a strong language. If you really wished anything, you could have just told us and we would bring it to you. Now, what was the response of that leader? Let me take first this phone call. We have a phone call from Syria. Assalamu alaikum, sister. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. How are you, sister? How are you, sister? How are you, sister? Alhamdulillah. Jazakum Allah, sister. Alhamdulillah, I'm all right. I'm from Syria. I ask Allah to keep you for a Muslim. Jazakum Allah, I'm all right with you. First of all, I'm sorry, I'm not fluent in English language. No, mashallah, you speak very good English. Go ahead. Thank you very much. But I will try to speak it now because I hope to contribute with you. Go ahead, please go ahead, go ahead. Jazakallah khairan for all your program. For us, so we are studying in secondary school. We are taking the Western uh, history as a basically a subject in our school. Yes. How can we have good generation with it? And I have written a uh, research about the woman in Islamic world, pre and in Islamic world. I hope to send it to you, Shalal. How can, how can I do that? So, what was the research about? 
about the women in Islamic world, pre-Islamic world and in Islamic world. Okay, okay. Um, actually, this topic is is very deep and it needs a lot of references. Um, Okay, I would suggest, sister, that you write an email to us, and inshallah, I will answer you in detail. I will give you references, uh, either books or uh, some websites that will, inshallah, give you enough information. So please, do write to our email address. You know the email address, which is inspirations at huda.tv. Inshallah, I will give you enough information about this and more references, so inshallah, it will help you in both Arabic and English, inshallah. Okay, now let's see what happened. Abdul Muttalib came uh, and he said to the leader of the army, why did he come here? He said, the, uh, the leader of the army said, we don't, uh, he said, if you want wealth, if you want anything, we would give it to you. The leader of the army said, we don't want wealth, we don't want anything. All what we came for is to destroy this house. Because we heard that everyone entered this house was safe. And we came to scare its people and to scare everyone here. Now this was the response of the leader of the army. What happened after that? Great events happened. Inshallah, join us next week to find out what happened. And to see what happened on that day. Because there was a great event that happened on that very day. What was that? Join us next week. I leave you in peace. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.